Hello, Saddleback. Have I told you lately that I love you? And I want to say hi to all of our campuses all around uh, California and the world. You know what? Saddleback Berlin, Saddleback uh, uh, Buenos Aires, Saddleback uh, Hong Kong, I haven't got to tell you much about them, but those things, those places are exploding with growth and they're reaching a whole new generation of people and uh, I'm just so proud of what they're doing. We've got teams going over all the time. If you ever want to go to one of our Saddlebacks around the world, just let me know and I'll hook you up for a ride. It's a lot of fun. Before we look at God's word, I want to give you four important dates. Would you write these down? Four important dates. One of them is next Sunday afternoon, February 23rd. Next Sunday afternoon, I want to meet with all of our small group hosts here at the Lake Forest campus. Everybody's going to be coming in from all the campuses, all 8,000 of my personal friends. And uh, we're going to have a party. We're going to celebrate what God's been doing in the uh, Transformed series and I'm going to share with you some insider information. So you make sure your host of your small group is here next Sunday afternoon. We're going to give you some new materials and some you know, exciting things. Then uh, February 27th, that's a Thursday. And that's Saddleback at the Movies Day. And all of our campus, we're going to be renting out theaters across Southern California for a one-day advance showing of the movie Son of God. Now it officially opens to everybody else the day before, the day after on Friday, but we've made some arrangements to get it early to, for you to bring your friends to, and you can, as you heard earlier, you can uh, get the tickets out on the patios at each of our campuses afterwards. That's going to be great. What a lot of people don't know is that Mark and Roma Downey, who produced that movie, asked me over a year ago to write a small group curriculum to go with the movie. And so during the month of March and April, all of our small groups were going to study the life of Jesus. And uh, this is the curriculum. It's out, uh, printed by uh, Lifeway Press. It's Son of God, the Life of Jesus in You. And it's, it's a beautiful curriculum. It has a DVD in it. And what I did is I took scenes from each of the movie. They're in here on the DVD. So you watch those scenes in the small group. And then key events from Jesus' life and how it relates to your life. For instance, we're, session one is Jesus' baptism and, and its importance for your baptism. Then Jesus' temptation and the lessons for your temptation. Then Jesus' suffering and what it means to when you go through suffering. Jesus' death and your death, Jesus' resurrection and your resurrection, Jesus' ministry and your ministry. We're gonna all do this after we finish 50 days of transformation in our small groups and we'll be passing this out to all of our hosts this next weekend. That's going to be a great thing. The third thing is March 8th. If you write that down, March 8th, particularly if you're a businessman, businesswoman, we do an annual Orange County Summit on business and entrepreneurship. It's on creativity and transformation this year. You'd figure that. And uh, that's a Saturday, and we'll all be coming to the Lake Forest campus from all of our campuses. And I've arranged for some of the top business minds in the nation to come and speak including the number one business uh, uh, author, Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote Blink and who wrote Tipping Point and others. He's coming to speak. Rich Carlgaard, who is um, the, the publisher of Forbes magazine, he'll be here. A lot of well-known business leaders are coming, and you want to bring some friends to that. And then the fourth thing is March 28th, and that is going to be the gathering on mental health and the church. I'm very excited about this. Um, it's a first. And Kay and I are putting this conference on, one day conference, and we got to co-host with us the Catholic Diocese of Orange, all the Catholic churches are gonna be involved in this, and the National Alliance on Mental Health, on Mental Illness. And it, we've got top names and speakers, I'll be speaking at it, Kay will be speaking at it, and a number of well-known speakers. Uh, one day, if you know someone who struggles with mental health, or you have a friend or loved one, you're gonna wanna come to that on March 28th. It's gonna be on an all day Friday and Friday evening. Now, if you have a Bible, I want you to open to the book of Psalms and pull out your message notes. We've been looking during 50 Days of Transformation, first at spiritual health and then at physical health. Last week, we looked at mental health. And this week, I want us to look at emotional health. And that is how to deal with how you feel. Last week, we talked about how to manage your mind, your thoughts. And this week, I want us to look at what the Bible says about how to manage your emotions how to deal with how you feel. Mark 12, 29 and 30, Jesus says this. The most important commandment is this. 
you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Do you hear the emotion in these words of Jesus? Jesus is saying, I don't want you to just kind of love me. I don't want you to kind of love God. I want you to love God passionately with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. God wants an emotional relationship with you. He doesn't want a head knowledge. Yeah, I know Jesus, I know God, blah, 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 blah. I want an emotional, passionate relationship that is full of feelings. Now, let me give you some facts about your emotions. Would you write these down before we get into this? First, God has emotions. Many people don't realize this. God has feelings. God is an emotional God. God feels joy, he feels grief, he feels pain, he feels hatred towards sin. He has frustration with the people around him just like, or like you do. And God has emotions. The only reason you have emotions is because you're made in God's image. If God wasn't an emotional God, you wouldn't have any emotions. We just celebrated Valentine's Day. If God wasn't a God of love, there would be no love on this planet. God is love. God created romance. God created emotions, created feelings. So God is an emotional God. Number two, my ability to feel is a gift from God. Your emotions are a gift from God. Now, they may not always seem that way, but even the negative ones have a role in your life. Emotions are a great asset. They're the one thing that make you human. If you didn't have emotion, you'd just be an atom automaton. You'd, you'd be a robot. You wouldn't be a human being. It is your emotional ability that allows you to love and create and, and to be faithful and loyal and, and kind and generous and all of the emotions that are attached to the good things in life. One of the most astounding verses in the Bible is Genesis 1:26. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And as I said, the only reason you have emotions is because God gave them to you and you were made in his image. Now number three, there are two extremes that you need to avoid in dealing with emotions. And one is called emotionalism and the other is called stoicism. Let me explain these to you. Emotionalism means all that matters is how I feel. Emotionalism is the, the extreme of saying, the only thing that matters in life is how I feel. Doesn't matter what I think, doesn't matter what's right or wrong, doesn't matter what's popular or unpopular, good or bad. What only matters is do what you feel. And if it feels good, do it. And that extreme of emotionalism means everything I do in life is based on my emotions. They control my life, they dominate my life, they run my life, and, and I'm a very emotional person. Then stoicism is the exact opposite, and it basically says feelings aren't important at all. Feelings are not important at all. The only thing that matters is your intellect and your will, your volition and your intelligence. And so the Stoics said, you know, emotions are not a part of life. Feelings really don't matter. Now it's really funny because Stoics often marry emotional people. And emotional people often marry Stoics. And a typically often in a marriage you have one who's a stuffer and one who's a gusher. Okay, stuffers and gushers marry. Now stuffers always get frustrated with gushers because they think they're too emotional. And, and gushers always get madder with stuffers because they think they're too uptight and, and uh, you know, closed down and shut down. Stuffers think you really shouldn't be sharing your emotions and uh, gushers think if you're not sharing your emotions, you're not being authentic. Okay, actually both of these are extreme positions. And, and the, the happy medium is where you really wanna be. It's not emotionalism or stoicism. It's interesting, there are entire Christian denominations built on these two approaches to emotions. You probably know some Christians who have decided that it doesn't really matter how you feel, the only thing that matters is the truth of the word of God. And, and they downplay emotion, they say, you know what, that's like the caboose, the train can run with or without the emotion, it's not important. Well, that's not right. That's not right, God gave you your emotions for a reason. And God wants you to, immerse, to worship him emotionally. He wants you to feel it. In fact, 
God complains in scripture many times about you're just worshiping with your lips but not with your emotion, not with your heart. You don't really feel it. And by the way, the word emotion isn't used that often in the Bible because instead the word uses, the, the Bible uses the word passions or affections or the number one term for emotions is heart. Now we still use that today. We just had Valentine's Day and we say, I give you my heart and heart is a symbol of love and, and, and emotions. And even today, I say, I love you with all my heart. And, and, and of course, in the Bible, this is the metaphor that, that uh, the mind represents the intellect and the heart represents the emotions. We now know that those are actually two different circuit systems in your brain and, and uh, that your emotions have an amazing uh, system as well as your, your thoughts do. And some things you just react emotionally without even thinking about it. But some Christians, they just say emotions aren't important. Then there are other Christians who say emotions are all that matters. And when they come to church, they're looking for an emotion. And when they worship, they want an ocean of emotion. <laughs> and they want a quiver in the liver. And if I haven't been enraptured in a moment of worship, then I haven't worshiped. Well, that's wrong too. And a lot of people are actually seeking an emotion, not seeking God when they worship. And it becomes an idol too. So you can make your mind an idol and make doctrine and theology and intellectual uh, or an exercise of, of theology a, a, a God, or you can make your emotion and your experience a God, and both of those are wrong. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it, God gave you both a mind and an emotion, and they're both important to you. Now number four, the Bible tells us that God gave us the book of Psalms in, uh, in order to understand our emotions. And if you have a hard time with some emotions in your life, you need to spend a lot of time in the book of Psalms. Psalms has every emotion known to man in it. The good ones and the bad ones, the positive and the negative. You read some of those Psalms, you think, why is this chapter in the Bible? It's there to teach you about even those negative emotions. Because not all Psalms are about praise and thanksgiving. There are Psalms of anger, there are Psalms of, uh, of complaining, there are songs of lament and sorrow, there are Psalms of arguing with God. Every emotion known to man is in the Psalms and God is saying, all of these are legitimate. I gave these things to you. So we're gonna look today at how to deal with how you feel. Now this week in your small group, I'm going to teach you in the, in the video portion of the Bible study, I'm gonna teach you how to heal damaged emotions. And there are five things you need to do according to scripture on how to heal if you've been hurt deeply, emotionally, by somebody in your past, you need to not miss this week's small group. It's very, very important. But what I wanna do this weekend is do two things. Talk to you about why the Bible says it's important to learn how to manage your emotions. And that's a skill, and you can get good at it. Most people are not good at managing their emotions. They're not good at it at all, but you can, and if you do, you will have enormous advantages over the other people in your life if you know how to manage your emotions. It's the key to peace of mind, it's the key to success, and a lot of other things. Uh, but we're gonna teach you that, and then I'm gonna teach you the first initial steps on how to do it, okay? So quickly, four important reasons why you need to learn to deal with what you feel. Number one, because my feelings are often unreliable. My feelings are often unreliable. They can lead you in the wrong direction. How many times have you thought, I know this is the right thing to do. I just feel it in my gut. And you do it, and it doesn't work out. Every one of us have done that. Your gut is often wrong. Your intuition is often flawed. Your emotions often lead you down a blind alley. You can't depend on everything you feel. Now last week I said, you don't have to believe everything you think and you don't have to accept everything you feel because not everything you feel is right, not everything you feel is authentic, and not everything you feel is reality. Some of the things you feel about yourself are flat out dead wrong and some of the things you feel about other people are dead wrong. You say, I'm sure this is the right direction, but it's, it's not. So you need to manage your emotions. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There's a way that seems, circle seems, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. So your emotions are not infallible. Just because you feel it doesn't make it true. Our feelings are often wrong and they often guide us in the wrong direction. Number two, I have to learn to manage my emotion because I don't want to be manipulated. 
And if you don't control your emotions, they will control you. And you will be manipulated by your moods. And if you're always guided by your feelings rather than by what's right, by your commitments, by the truth, if you're always guided by feelings, other people are gonna take advantage of you. They're going to, they're gonna take advantage of you. In fact, salesmen and advertisers are trained in how to stir up your emotions because they know that if they can get you hooked emotionally, they're gonna buy the product. And so the color of the packaging and the music and the commercial and the things that they say in the presentation are all designed to elicit, elicit emotional response. And if you make decisions like what you buy based on emotion, that's called impulse buying, you're gonna buy stuff that you don't really need or want. Has anybody ever done this? Could I see your hands? Yeah, yeah, we all have. You, you know, we've all, you go, why in the world did I buy that? Because the guy got my emotions and oh, I need to buy that, I really need that. Um, the Bible says in Proverbs 25, 28, I love this, the New American Bible, like an open city with no defenses is the man with no check on his feelings. If you have no check on your feelings, you have no governor, you have no moderator, you have no manager on your feelings, he says, you're like a city with no defenses. Let me show you this verse in another translation here on the screen. New Living Translation says this. A person without self-control is as defenseless as a city with broken down walls. Not only are you defenseless against the manipulation of other people, but you are defenseless to the manipulation by your old nature. We talked about that last week. And your old nature knows your moods and it just whips you around and it puts a mood in your life and all of a sudden you don't wanna do what you need to do, what's right to do, what's healthy to do, what's good to do because you are being manipulated by a mood. Worst of all, Satan's favorite tool, listen to this, Satan's favorite tool in your life is negative emotions. It's his favorite tool. He will use fear to whip you around. He will use resentment and jealousy and envy to whip you around. He'll use bitterness and worry and anxiety. He'll use shame to beat you up. Satan's favorite tool is to whip you around with negative emotions. If you don't know how to manage your emotions, you are helpless against Satan. You don't want to be manipulated, so you want to learn the skill we're going to look at this weekend because he wrecks so much havoc in our lives emotionally. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, be self-controlled and alert. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. If you don't have self-control, he will eat your lunch. That's what he's saying. Okay, number three. I need to manage my emotions because I want to please God. I don't want to just know that my feelings are unreliable and I, I, I know that I don't want to be manipulated by other people or by my old nature or by the devil, but I also want to please God. And God cannot be God in my life if emotions are God in my life. God can't rule my life if my emotions rule my life. Jesus can't be Lord of my life if my emotions are my Lord of my life. If I make all my decisions simply based on how I feel, then I've made my feelings God. And then God can't be God. The Bible says in Romans 8, 6 to 8, to be controlled by human nature results in death. But to be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. And those who obey their old human nature cannot please God, circle that. So you, you can't please God if your emotions dominate your life and they are running your life and your decisions are made based on how do I feel rather than what does God say. Finally, number four, the fourth reason I must manage my emotion is because I wanna succeed in life. This is one of the number one predictors of success or failure in your life. Do you know how to manage your moods? Do you know how to deal with how you feel? Do you know how to control your emotions? If you don't learn how to do this, you will never be the success in life that God wants you to be or that you want to be. Study after study after study has shown that your EQ is more important than your IQ. 
that for success in business, emotional quotient is far more important than your intelligence quotient. Your IQ isn't nearly, a lot of people don't have a high IQ, are very successful in life, but they've got good smarts in dealing with their emotions. They've got good smarts in dealing with how they feel, and as a result, they're people people. They know how to, how to get along with others. We've all known people who live by their emotions and waste their life. They get up in the morning and say, what do I feel like doing today? Well, not much, so they don't do it much. And, and if, you deal, don't, if you only deal with how you feel and you just go based on what you're feeling, you're not gonna succeed in life. You're not gonna make much of your life. The Bible says in Proverbs 5.23, people get lost. He's talking about in life. People get lost and they, they die because of their foolishness and their lack of self-control. How many people do you know who ruined the reputation because of their lack of self-control? How many people do you know who ruined a job opportunity because of something that happened on a stupid one-night party? And foolishness and party, and then all of a sudden, boom, there, you know, everything happened from a, an unwanted pregnancy to uh, all, all kinds of different things. People get lost. People die. That's the opposite of living because of their foolishness and lack of self-control. Now, when you give your heart to Jesus, that includes your emotions. So when you say, I gave my heart to Jesus, you gave your emotions to him to be managed by him because the heart is the seat of your emotions. And Jesus wants to be a Lord of how you feel, not just what you think and what you do. He wants to be Lord of your emotions. In fact, the Bible says this to believers, 1 Peter 4, 2. From now on, you must live the rest of your lives, the rest of your earthly lives, controlled by God's will, not by human desires. What are human desires? It's your emotions. It's your affections. It's your, 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 the, the way you feel. He says, for the rest of your life, now that you're a believer, your life is to be controlled by God's will, not by how you feel. So then how do I do that? Well, this is what I want to spend most of the time on this weekend. How do I manage an unmanageable or an unwieldy or an unwanted feeling? Well, you do three things. And let's get right into it. Number one, the first thing you got to do in dealing with an emotion is you must name it. You must name it. What does that mean? I've got to identify it. I've got to be specific. I've got to pinpoint exactly what it is. You can't manage a vague feeling. You can only change, control, manage something that you have identified. And if you don't know what the problem is in your life, then you certainly can't work on it. Now, you are not as good in touch with your emotions at being in touch with your emotions as you think you are. We all think we're very, very much in touch with our emotions. No, we're not really. You may even be very emotional and still not in touch with your true emotions and why you feel the way you feel. I got a friend who's a pastor and he and his wife are having a little bit of marriage problem. They went to counseling, which is a great thing and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing to do. And he was uh, going to counseling and he said, uh, the counselor, one of the questions asked him, so, so how, how in touch are you with your feelings? How do you think you are? And uh, this, this guy said, well, oh, I think I'm very much in touch. I'm, a, I'm, I'm what you call a sensitive guy, a sensitive man. <laughs> and and uh, the counselor said, well, then, great. Tell me some of the emotions that you felt this last week. Well, uh, you know, he couldn't name anything. He said, I, I couldn't come up with anything. I was just drawing a blank when I... I was asked, what emotions did you feel this last week? And he said, finally I said, uh, I was tired and I was hungry. <laughs> and the counselor immediately shot back, those aren't emotions. And they're not. They're drives. They're not emotions. Okay. And so, you know, he thought he was really in touch, but, but, but he really wasn't. Now, we laugh at that, but I have to admit I'm often confused about my emotions. I'm often confused about how I feel. I, sometimes I can't define it. I couldn't tell you the number of times I've been sitting talking to my wife and Kay will say, so what are you feeling right now? 
And I go, I don't know. I don't know, you know. I don't know what I'm, you know, I know I'm feeling something, but I can't put a name on it. I can't, I can't identify it. I can't name it. Any of you ever feel like this? You know what I'm talking about? You just go, I, I know I'm feeling something, but I, I don't know what I'm feeling, Yogi. You know? <laughs> and, and so if you can't name it, you can't change it. You gotta, you gotta name it first. Sometimes I feel like David. Psalm 55, 2. Look here on the screen. He says, my thoughts are restless and I'm confused. Well, that's the way we are a lot of times about our our, uh, our feelings, we're, we're confused. And so you wanna ask a couple questions. Write these two questions down. This is the first step to managing your emotions, to becoming an emotionally strong man, to becoming an emotionally strong woman. Ask these two questions. First, you ask, what am I really feeling? That's the first question. What am I really feeling? And what I mean by that is you need to scratch beneath the surface because what, you're, what you think you're feeling is often not the real feeling. Sometimes you think, I see, I'm feeling a little down today. I'm feeling a little discouraged. I, I, I've got the blues. I'm, I'm a little depressed. And you think that the problem is depression. No, that's not the problem. You need to ask, what's making me depressed? And then you look a little bit deeper, and it was, I got criticized at work, and I didn't like that or I just got laid off, or an expectation didn't happen the way I expected it to happen. And you need to look and find the disappointment or find the worry. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's repressed or put down or covered up anger. There are a lot, so a lot of times what you think you're feeling isn't really it. You say, what am I really feeling here? And if you'll stop and, and peel the onion a bit, you go, you know, really, my irritation isn't with you, honey. My irritation was what somebody said to me right before I left work and came home. And now I'm taking it out on you. You know what I'm talking about? It's a, it's a transference there. So you say, what am I really feeling? And then the other question you want to ask is, what are my triggers? What triggered this? That's a good thing to say. Now, if I were to ask you to name the emotion that gives you the most trouble in your life, would you be able to immediately say, oh, I know what it is. If you don't, you're not as in touch with yourself as you think you are. Because you have certain emotions that trigger responses and you have th certain triggers that trigger emotions. Now, if you can't talk about it, listen, it's already out of control. Like, if you have a fear and you're afraid to talk about it, guess what? It's already out of control. And it is actually in talking about it that you gain control. And if you don't talk it out, you're going to take it out on your body. You've heard me say this before. When you swallow your emotions, your stomach keeps score. Emotions weren't meant to be swallowed. They were meant to be shared. They were meant to be shared. So you ask yourself, what, what's the trigger? And, and what triggered this? Sometimes a trigger can be sight. In other words, um, I visited a particular place and I saw that and all of a sudden I feel very moody or very angry or it, it, it brings up something in the past. Sometimes a smell can trigger an emotion. Isn't that true? You smell something, it can make you feel warm and, and comfortable or it can make you feel afraid and angry, okay? Uh, a, a trigger might be something you hear, they, the, the sound of somebody's voice or certain noise, touch. And the way someone touches you could trigger an emotional response. You need to know these things. But you can't manage what you don't know. Taste. You can taste certain things and it'll send you back to childhood. And you, and you have all kinds of experiences on that. So you say, what am, I really, what am I really feeling and what triggered this? Now write this down. I can't tame it until I name it. I can't tame it until I name it. I can't solve a problem that I can't identify. So you start by naming the emotion that you're feeling, the negative emotion that you're feeling. The second thing you do that the Bible tells us to do is this. Challenge it. Challenge it. You challenge what you're feeling. 
You don't just automatically accept what you're feeling. You don't automatically assume that it's accurate. You don't automatically assume that what you feel is the truth, correct, or even reality. You challenge it. Is what I'm feeling, do I really, are things really as bad as I feel they are? Probably not. Or are things as really as good as I feel they are? Probably not. So you need to ask yourself is, you know, some, some questions. You, you challenge it. Now, David, who wrote many of the Psalms, often asks God to challenge his emotions. Now that's pretty smart, since God understands you better than you do. God knows what you're feeling even when you don't know it. And God knows what triggered it even when you don't know what triggered that emotion. And so if you say, God, I don't know what I'm feeling, and I don't know where it came from, but I need your help, that's a good thing to do. David often asked God to evaluate his feelings. And since God is impartial, God can help you out. Look at this verse on the screen. The Bible says in Psalm 26 2, Lord, cross-examine me. Test my motives and my affections. What are your affections? They're your emotions. Test my motives and, and my feelings, what I feel, what I, my, my affectations, my, my emotions. So you ask God to help you evaluate it. But let me give you another one that's even more personal. Get a friend to help you. And that is sometimes it's best to have a friend who can challenge what you're feeling. Now you gotta have a pretty close friend to do that. Have you given anybody in your life the permission to challenge your feelings? Or does everybody just have to be a yes man or yes woman to you? That if you feel a certain way, there's no room for, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? That's a correct understanding. A true friend is somebody you give permission to say, are you sure about that? They get, you give them the ability to challenge your emotion and say, you know, Rick, I don't, think you're, I don't think you're thinking correctly right now. I don't think what you're feeling is actually true. Job had a friend like that. His name was Eliphaz. And in Job 15, verse 12, Eliphaz asked Job, why has your heart carried you away? And why do your eyes flash? Now that's a poetic way of saying, how come you've run off the deep end and why do you get so angry? Do you have anybody who can ask you that question? And you wouldn't get mad at them? That you, you know they're doing it out of love? You need partners in your life. You need not only a small group, that's a good place to find them, but you need a spiritual partner. Not a lot, just one person who you've given the right to challenge what you're feeling and say, and you know what, I don't think you're thinking correctly. That's not right. Why are, you, why are you going off the deep end on this? And why are you getting so angry about it? Give somebody that permission. Now let me give you three questions to ask about your own emotions when you're trying to figure out how to deal with how I feel, okay? So let's say you're going, let's say you're angry, or you're upset, or you're irritated, or you're frustrated, or you're depressed, or, or whatever. You ask these three questions. Number one, what's the real reason, the real reason that I'm feeling this? And that goes back to what we were talking earlier you know, maybe it's fear, maybe it's worry, maybe it's hooked into something that your dad said to you years and years and years ago, and when your husband said it to you, all of a sudden, boy, he gets all the wrath that you'd pent up against your dad. Or vice versa. What's the real reason I'm feeling this? Second question, ask yourself, is it true? Is what I'm feeling right now true? There's a, a point where Elijah in the Bible gets so down, discouraged, depressed, and he comes crying to God and he's complaining. He says, God, I'm the only one in the entire nation of Israel left serving you. And God challenges us, are you kidding me? I got all these people who still serve me. Why, why are you ask, acting like this? You're acting like you're the only one trying to do the right thing in the whole world? No, that's not true. So what's the real reason I feel this way? And in that case, he was tired. And uh, is it true? In that case, it wasn't true. Then the third question, this is really important. Is what I'm feeling helping me or hurting me? 
Sometimes this is the simplest thing to changing an emotion by simply saying, is what I'm feeling right now going to help me get what I want to get or is it actually going to hinder me getting for what I get? In other words, will I get what I want by continuing to feel this way? A lot of feelings that we have feel natural, but they're actually, they're actually self-defeating. For instance, Let's say you go in and you sit down at a, a restaurant and the service is slow, and I mean it's slow. And you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting and waiting to be served. And then a couple comes in like 15 minutes after you and sits down, and then they get their meal before you do. And you look at your wife and you're going, are you seeing this? Are you watching this here? And you're starting to get a little irritated and all of a sudden you feel an emotion welling up inside of you. Now, you go, what's the real reason I'm feeling this? I'm hungry. Okay. 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 Uh, is it true? Yeah, it's true. I'm frustrated because the service is slow here. So that one is particularly true. But then, is it helping or is it hurting? Okay, question. Do you get better service by getting angry at a waitress? No, absolutely not. And so, get it, you know, it feels good to get angry. It's like, how come this place, blah, 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 blah. You may feel better, but you just got worse service. You don't get it. It's usually the exact opposite of what you want. Driving to services today, I had, I had the radio on, and I was hearing one of the chief of police, I think it was chief of police in Long Beach, and he was saying, he was teaching, he said, we, we teach our, our, uh, our, our cops in a crisis, you lower your voice, not raise it. Well, naturally, in a crisis, you want to raise your voice. And, and he said, no, no, what's that? That's just going to escalate the problem. Escalate it. So you ask yourself, is this emotion actually getting me where I want to go? So let's say you want to change your husband or your kids or your wife, or, or somebody who works with you. Does nagging work? Has it ever worked anywhere? Let me ask you this, does nagging work on you? When somebody comes and tells you all the things that you're doing wrong, doesn't that just make you wanna change? <laughs> no, no, all it does is make you defensive. So you need to ask yourself, I know I'm frustrated right now with this person in my life, but is expressing my frustration to them gonna actually make the change and, and I'm gonna get what I want out of this? No, it is not. That's called managing your emotions. You've got, you've got to name it, here's, here's what I'm feeling, and, and here's the trigger, and then you've got to challenge it. What's the real reason I feel this way? Is it true? Is it helping me or is it hurting me? And then the third thing you gotta do is you got to tame it or change it. You gotta change it. You, you, you've, got, you've gotta make the change in the emotion that you want to make when you have that unwanted emotion. Now, as I said, last week we talked about managing your mind, this week we're talking about managing your heart. If you want to succeed in life, you must learn how to master your moods. And when you have a mood, when you have an emotion that isn't getting you where you wanna get, you got two options. You either change it or you channel it. Change it or channel it. Let me talk to you about both of these things. Some emotions are so destructive, so damaging, so hurtful, so non-effective, the only attitude, only thing you can do is just change it. You gotta change what you're feeling. Look at this verse on the screen. Philippians 2.5 says this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So your attitude, that includes your emotions, what you're feeling, should be the same as that of Jesus. So you ask yourself, how would Jesus feel in this situation? Would Jesus get irritated with this waitress? No. Would Jesus be yelling at the person? No. Would, would Jesus uh, uh, be giving up, wringing his hands and worrying that it isn't all gonna work out? No. Would Jesus be fearful? No. Would Jesus be 
uh, worried? No. So the, the bottom line on this one is I instantly dismiss any feeling that doesn't make me more like Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as Jesus. So if I'm, I'm feeling an emotion and I've identified it and I go, would Jesus have this emotion? No. Then that's not the way I should be responding to my wife right now. Because Jesus wouldn't respond that way. So I, I, I instantly dismiss any feeling. Jesus would not be prideful. Jesus would not be envious. Jesus would not be bitter. Jesus would not be enraged. I would instantly drop that attitude. But sometimes you can even take a negative emotion that you're feeling and rather than change it, you channel it. You channel it. What does that mean? You use it for good. For instance, let's say you have been the victim of injustice. You have experienced prejudice, maybe racial profiling. You have experienced unfairness in the classroom. Unfairness because you're a man or a woman or a different color from somebody else or whatever. Let's, but you've had something unfair in your life. And you naturally, the emotion's gonna come up in you is anger. That's a legitimate response. Is my anger going to get me what I want? Probably not. But can my anger be used for good to help other people? Yes. And all of a sudden you become a champion for justice. Because you know what it means to have experienced injustice. Does that make sense? And so you take a negative emotion, anger, and when you, when you use your anger for your benefit, that's selfish anger. That's a sin. When you use your anger for the benefit of other people, that's righteous anger. See, anger is not a sin. The Bible says in Scripture, be angry and sin not. It's what you do with that anger, and it's the reason you're angry that makes it either sin or not. You can get angry. If somebody hurt my wife and kids, I'd get angry. I would, because anger is sometimes an evidence of love. If you never get angry about anything, it means you're apathetic. It means you have no love in your life. Because if you love something or someone and somebody hurts them, you're gonna get angry. That's the natural thing. Love gets angry. God gets angry. And the only reason you have the ability to get angry is because God gets angry. God gets angry at sin. God gets angry at evil. God gets angry when women are raped. God gets angry when children are molested. God gets angry when people are abused and misused and injustice. And so you could take a negative emotion and you can use it in a positive way. Let me give you another example. Many of you have wanted to be married and it just didn't happen. And your love has been blocked to date. Some of you have, are married and you've wanted to have children and it hasn't happened and your love has been blocked to date. What do you do with a blocked love? Do you pull yourself back into a prison, lock the door, pull up the drawbridge, fill the moat with alligators and say, I'm never gonna let anybody hurt me again? No, that's dumb. What do you do? What do you do with a blocked love? You rechannel it. Maybe you didn't get to love the person you wanted to love, but the world is full of people who need your love. Maybe you didn't get to have the children you wanted to have, but there's 137 million orphans in the world. And there are children on your street who need your love. You rechannel a blocked love. You use it for good. You don't stew in your hurt, you use it for good. If you don't change the emotion, you channel the emotion. And you use it for good. 10 months ago, when Matthew died, I entered into the most deep possible grief you could imagine. I'm still not out of it. And I cry every day for the death of my son and the loss of his life. But I decided from the first moment 
that I was going to channel that grief for good. And that I would use my pain to help other people. And Kay did too. And we have been doing it. It's one of the reasons why we're doing the conference on mental illness. Because I'm not about to waste a hurt. I'm not about to waste any pain that I go through. If I'm going to have it, I'm going to use it for good. What pain in your life are you using for good? Maybe you have been in so much pain, you didn't even want to talk about it. Then you need to learn to manage your emotions. You need to name it, you need to challenge it, and then you need to channel it if you're not going to change it. And use it for good. And God can use it in your life. Your greatest ministry could come out of your deepest pain. Your greatest ministry will not come out of your strengths and successes. You do your strengths and successes, people just go, well, goody for you. You're good at it. But if it comes out of your pain, then it could help others. So you change it or you channel it. Now, what about those ones that need changing? How do you tame a wild emotion? You, got, you say, I am a worrier and I cannot stop worrying. And I can't stop that emotion. I just worry, 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 worry. I am a perfectionist and I can't stop it. I just criticize and judge and pick and nag. and uh, I am lazy and I just tend to be lazy. I, I, all these emotions in my mind, fear, I'm a fearful person. Anger, I'm a naturally angry person and I lose my temper. I either blow up or I clam up and there are different kinds of, uh, you know, there's, the, there's Mount Vesuvius and there's the mute and there's the martyr, poor me. There's lots of ways, but you, it's a problem in your life. How do you tame a wild emotion? Well, not by willpower, not by willpower. The Bible says this in Zechariah 4, 6. You will not succeed by your own strength or power but by my spirit says the Lord Almighty Zechariah 4 6 you don't change an emotion by willpower I'm gonna force this change emotion it doesn't work that way he says it's not by power it's not by might it's by my spirit says the Lord well how does that happen how do you let the Holy Spirit change an emotion that's hurting you and hurting other people in your life let me give you two final suggestions. Two starter suggestions. Number one, every day ask God to fill me with his spirit. Every single day, I don't get out of bed, my feet don't touch the ground without me saying, Holy Spirit, fill me today. I need your spirit in my life. Because it's not by might nor my power, not willpower, but by my spirit, I'm going to be able to manage my moods and my emotions today. Galatians 5, and 23 says this. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love. Joy. Peace. We could stop right there. I'll just take those three. My life would be a whole lot better if my life was just filled with love, joy, and peace. Wouldn't yours? But there's nine of them here. Nine fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, and peace. Patience. Anybody need that one? Kindness. You are kind when the Holy Spirit fills your life. When you're unkind, there's no way the Holy Spirit is filling your life. The Holy Spirit does not motivate unkindness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. You're gentle when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You're gentle with kids, you're gentle with your spouse, you're gentle with your customers. And notice the last one, number nine is what? Self-control, circle that. Self-control comes from God control. Self-control comes from God control. The more I let God control my mind and emotions, the more self-control I have. I don't become a religious nut, I become more self-controlled. A lot of people think, if I let the Holy Spirit fill my life, they're going to turn me into some nut religious fanatic. No, if you let the Holy Spirit fill your life, you get more self-control than you've ever had in your life. That's a good thing. Now, it says, when the Holy Spirit controls our life, he fills you with this. When you're filled with love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control, that's a whole lot better 
than being filled with anger, worry, fear, guilt, shame, anger, uh, worry, and all these other things. So what about it? When you're put under pressure at work, at home, or anywhere else, do you know what comes out of you? Whatever's inside you. And if you're filled with worry, fear, doubt, loneliness, envy, jealousy, bitterness, gossip, when the world puts on pressure, you know what's going to come out? Worry, fear, doubt, anger, ego, and all those things. But when you're filled with the Spirit and the world puts pressure on you, you know what's going to come out? Love, joy, peace, patience. If I take a bottle of shampoo and I squeeze that bottle, what comes out? Shampoo. If I take a tube of toothpaste and I squeeze it, what's come out? Toothpaste. Peanut butter doesn't come out, toothpaste comes out. Why? Because whatever's in it comes out when it's under pressure. That's true of your life. Whatever's in you comes out when you're under pressure. And the more pressure you get, if you, you see, when I'm full of myself, almost anything can tick me off. When I'm full of God, nothing can tick me off. I'm filled with love and joy and peace. Doesn't matter what happens, I can handle it. This is nothing. I can just handle anything. So whatever's inside of you is gonna come out. So the first key to management of emotions is to be filled with the Spirit so that you're full of love and joy. It's like if you got a cup of coffee and, and you shake it, whatever's gonna come out is what's in it. Be filled with the Spirit. And that's what's gonna come out in your emotions. Number two, the other thing to do, not only every day ask God to fill me with the Spirit, but every day ask God to help me manage my mouth. You knew I was gonna get to this one. <laughs> every day I ask God to help me manage my mouth. When I get up in the morning, I say, Lord, put a guard on my mouth, just zip it up. Don't let me say stuff. The Bible says in the multitude of words there is sin. Proverbs 13.3 says this. Self-control means controlling the tongue. Now this is what the whole chapter in the book of James is about. It, there's a whole chapter in the book of James on the power of your words and your tongue. And it says, you know, a giant horse, you could have a, a rider on the horse that weighs one-fourth the weight of the horse and yet it's controlling the horse. Why? Because there's a bit in the horse's mouth. And when, wherever the mouth goes, the horse is going. Same's true with you. The Bible says that your tongue is like the rudder on a big ship. Little tiny rudder can direct the big ship in any direction. And the tongue is the rudder of your life. What you say is where you're going to go. And you're not going to experience what God wants you to have until you say what God wants you to say. So you say, Lord, help me to manage my mouth. Now here's the last key. Write this down. Make God's word my word. Make God's word my word. In other words, begin to put the words of the Bible into your mind. Memorize some verses. Write them down on little cards and memorize them. Write underlined verses in your Bible. Read the Bible every day. Listen to the Bible. Subscribe to Drive Time Devotions. Get the word of God in you every day. Feed yourself on the word of God because then when his word becomes your word, you're gonna see miracles take place in your life. Psalm 119.11 says this. I have hidden your word in my heart. What's your heart? That's where your emotions are. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In Psalm 19.14, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. Notice the connection between your heart and your mouth. What's inside your heart is gonna come out of your mouth. Jesus said it's not what goes in you that makes you unclean, it's what comes out of you that makes you unclean. And my heart is revealed in my words. So some of you, what you need to say is, God, I need a heart transplant. I've had a bitter heart. I've had a worried heart. I've had an angry heart. I've had a lonely heart. I've had a prideful heart. I've had an arrogant heart. God, I've had a jealous heart. I've had an envious heart. 
I've had an impatient heart. God, I need a heart transplant. And when you say that to God, and you say, fill me with your spirit, he'll put a new heart inside of you. And when you get a new heart, you get new words. And your words direct your life. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I, I thank you that you are an emotional God. I thank you that you gave us the ability to feel that we're not robots, that we're not unfeeling, uncaring, that we can experience both highs and lows in life. Help us to avoid the extremes of emotionalism, that all that matters is how I feel, and stoicism of feeling that things aren't important, feelings aren't important at all. I thank you for the, the book of Psalms that show us that every emotion actually is understood by you and that you can give us the power to change it or to channel it. Now you pray. Say, Lord, I know that my feelings are often unreliable and I don't want to build my life on feelings. I want to build my life on your truth. I don't want to be manipulated by other people or by Satan. Or I don't want to be manipulated even by my own old nature. But I want to be self-controlled and alert. More than that, Lord, I want to please you. And I want to do the things that please you and I want you to be the Lord of my emotions. And I want to succeed in life by being controlled by your will, not by my feelings. So help me to practice what I've just learned this week. When I start to get upset or when I feel overwhelmed by a very strong emotion, help me to name it. Help me to figure out what am I really feeling and what's the trigger, what triggered me and why am I feeling this way? You've said in your word that wisdom gives a man patience. Help me to understand my emotions and where they came from. And then, Lord, help me to challenge my emotions, to not automatically accept them as the gospel truth, but, but to ask, is it true? And is it helpful? And is holding on to this emotion going to get me the result I need? Help me to realize the real reason that I feel what I'm feeling and to challenge my emotions and not just automatically accept them. And then help me to change or channel what needs to be changed and channel what could be used for good. Dear God, beginning right now, I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want my life to be filled with love, not hate, with peace, not chaos, with joy, not sorrow, and with patience, not impatience. Lord, I want to be kind. Fill me with goodness. Fill me with faith. Fill me with gentleness. Fill me with self-control. Help me to develop the habit of asking you to fill me moment by moment. And then, Lord, most of all, I ask you to help me to manage my mouth. May I learn to put your words in my mouth and to speak the word of truth. In your name I pray. Amen.